Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to this special webcast where we're going to be talking about five brand new topics on next year's CCNA exam. And notice I didn't say CCNA route switch because it's no longer a track specific CCNA. Uh, gone are the days of CCNA security and route switch and wireless and collaboration. Now there's sort of uh, one CCNA to rule them all, well, with one exception. They're still cyber ops for whatever reason, but it's, uh, it's one big CCNA. And when I first saw the blueprint of the CCNA, one of my first questions wa uh, was, what's new? Okay, we've got OSPF, no big deal here. We've got Spanning Tree, we've got EtherChat. What's the new stuff? And I felt that you might want to be trained on some of the new stuff because I've recently completed a four-month project where I've been developing a complete video course for the brand new CCNA for next year. Just finished that up this uh, this past week. And I had to dig into a lot of the new stuff and I wanted to share that with you in today's webcast. So uh, really excited that you, uh, you took about one to two hours out of your day to join us. Now, by the way, uh, if you want to chat in, you're welcome to do that. We've got people joining us through a couple of different portals right now. Some people are coming through the kwtrain.com page and you've got your own little, uh, uh, it's called chat roll and I'm able to see you. Some people are just joining us through uh, YouTube right now and that's great too and you're chatting in there. So I'm going to have to look back and forth between a couple of different chat interfaces to take the questions and also I don't have a moderator today I'm doing this uh, I'm doing this solo so don't be offended if I don't answer your questions right away uh, there's going to be a Q&A period I'll try to make it a good lengthy Q&A period at the end of today's session so just uh, hold up on your questions and I'll ask you uh, but if you want to chat amongst yourselves you're welcome to do that I I recommend that you really focus on, in on the presentation and take lots of notes, turn off your cell phone, eliminate distractions, because this is the only time that I've seen out on the interwebs, as I call it, where, um, where you're going to get some solid training on the brand new topics on the CCNA exam. So let's take a look at exactly what are our goals today. We're going to be talking about, let me move my picture out of the way, or I'm going to be, I'm going to be obscuring everything, so let me scoot myself out of the way here just a bit. There we go. What's on the agenda for today? Well, today we're going to be starting out with an introduction where I'm just going to make some comments in general about the new CCNA, some observations uh, that, um, that I've realized while developing the new course. And we're going to cover these five new topics. Now, here are the topics. The topics are uh, Cisco DNA Center, We'll talk about wireless LAN security. We'll get into JSON formatting, CRUD, which is a fun word to say. And we'll talk about three different configuration management utilities. And those are Puppet, Chef, and Ansible. And then something really exciting. I said I've been working for four months on this, uh, on this brand new CCNA uh, complete video course. You might, if you're a Cisco Press person, uh, you uh, get a lot of their material. On the Cisco Press site, they have sold my last two versions uh, of uh, the CCNA course. It goes back to, I think, 2013, 14, something like that. It's been many years. But uh, I decided when I was creating uh, the new course, I thought, you know what? Even though some of the topics, some of the videos could be reused, they, they the videos kind of look like they were made five years ago and I wanted to update everything and give you fresh new content and just reimagine everything. So I didn't reuse a single video when creating this course. And I'm going to be launching today at the end of this, I'm going to be launching today for the first time that brand new CCNA video training series. And it's not just videos, it's it's labs, it's questions, it's, it's everything you need and a bunch of bonuses. And I always like to reward people that attend live, uh, the, the live event. So I'm going to be having a special webinar only uh, offer for you to get this thing kicked off. But we're, we're going to be launching it officially today as part of this webinar. But that's coming up at the end. Stay tuned for that. And then we'll have some Q&A. But let's get right into it by, well, I, before we um, before we jump into the five topics, I did want to know why you're here. Uh, and you can chat into me if you would to let me know if you already have your CCNA, if you plan on taking the existing CCNA exam prior to February the 24th, do you plan on taking the new exam next year? What's your plan? What, what made you think that uh, you would want to spend an hour or two with me today to learn the new CCNA topics? Just, just go ahead and chat that in if you would. Let's see what people are saying. Let's see. Let's see. And by the way, there is like a 
I think it's like a 13 second delay from the time I speak something to the time you hear it. So I'm, I'm delaying right now. I'm stalling uh, to give you time to, to type something in. Let's see, Jonathan from uh, Jonathan says, uh, I've got a CCNA and will need to renew it at some point um, and um, might get my CCMP. Mason planning on taking it before February the 24th. Plan oh, wow. The, it, the responses are flooding and it's hard to read them all. Let's see. I just oh, Somebody says, uh, I just want to know what's new. That's fair. Planning on doing I-71 and 2 shortly, uh, hoping to achieve CCMP. Excited about the new tracks? I am too. I think Cisco did an awesome job. Let's take a look at YouTube. What's YouTube saying? Let's see. Working on CCN or ICND2. Going to test on the 25th. Awesome. Already got my CCNA, but wanted to see some of the new topics. I uh, just wanted to learn the new stuff. All right. Perfect. Perfect. We've got people all over the board here. Uh, we've got... Um, Let's see, uh, Will, Bro uh, Will Broad says, plan on taking the CCIA written exam. That's fantastic. Uh, planning on taking the new exam in 2000. Uh, and okay, yeah, the, well, we could read those for about another 10 minutes. But uh, thanks for the feedback. Uh, we're all over the board here. Some people going to take the old exam. Some people going to take the new exam. Some people going for higher certifications. And since we are going to be spending like an hour or two together, uh, I'm assuming that most of you have uh, have probably come across my path in the past. But if not, just wanted to give you a super quick bio. And I'm just going to take my, my face off the screen here, uh, my live video, so that I don't obscure anything. But here's my super quick bio. If you didn't know, my name is Kevin Wallace. And... I've got a couple of CCAs. I'm considered to be a CCA emeritus at this point because I've had my CCA for, wow, 2000, it was August 2001, so it's over... It's over 18 years now that I've uh, that I've had it. Wow. Yeah, and I got a couple of CCAs and route switching collaboration. I've been working with Cisco Gear since the very first Cisco router. Back in 1989, I worked with the original Cisco AGS Plus router. It wasn't called a router back in those days, little trivia. It was called a browter. It was a bridge and a router, and they called it a browter. But uh, yeah, I'll, I've been passionate about this stuff for nearly three decades. Uh, actually, exactly three decades now. And I taught courses for a, uh, for Cisco Learning Partners for about 14 years. I used uh, Real World. I was a network designer down at Walt Disney World in Florida, and I was involved in, or, or actually, I designed the network that ties together the different theme parks, the Magic Kingdom and Epcot, and the studios and Animal Kingdom, and a lot of the resorts. And uh, just learned a ton. They were an all Cisco shop. I've written a bunch of books, done a bunch of videos for uh, for Pearson. Uh, that's the parent company of Cisco Press. And uh, been a speaker a couple of times at Cisco Live and was honored to receive the Distinguished Speaker Award each of those times. Bottom line, uh, this is my life. I'm passionate about this stuff and I cannot wait to share with you this brand new content. So let's take a look at topic number one of five and that is Cisco DNA Center. Now Cisco DNA Center is a graphical way for us to do network management and when I first heard about it, maybe three years ago, I thought, okay, I've seen this before. I don't know if anybody goes back this far, but does anybody remember the old uh, the old Cisco Security Device Manager SDN? Wow, that was uh, not a great piece of software. And then there was uh, Cisco Configuration Professional they came out with where you had to have just the right version of Java and hold your mouth just right to get that to work. And, and when I thought, oh no, here's another graphical management interface. No, thank you. I'm all good. But as I got deeper into it, this is a game changer. Cisco DNA Center is nothing like so, no, the security device manager or the configuration or the Cisco Configuration Professional, this is a central place where we can manage our entire enterprise network. It is pretty amazing, to, uh, and I'm a huge fan of it now. Well, because with those other tools, we were managing one device at a time. Now we're managing everything all at once. We can give our intent, as Cisco calls it, to the DNA center, and it's going to send out appropriate configuration commands. That's just one of the things it can do to all of our devices. So let's go through the big, the big features of Cisco DNA Center. 
First of all, there is design. And I'm going to take you out to a live Cisco DNA Center server here in just a few moments. But one of the things we're going to be seeing is how we can use this as a design platform. If you've got a big multinational network, you can, you can start out with a map of the world. And within that map of the world, you can define different areas. And uh, you can define buildings within that area, your buildings, your company's buildings. And then you can import floor plans and show where every network device is installed. You can literally have your entire enterprise network drawn out, documented, diagrammed inside of Cisco DNA Center. And we can also use it to apply configuration, policy configuration. Now, one aspect of policy is security. Sure, we can set up access control lists. We can have groups. We can permit or deny based on IP addresses. One of my favorite policies, I'm a QoS person, one of my favorite things is we can set up quality of service policies. I'll show you that live here in just a few moments. And that's going to allow us to say, for this type of traffic, here's how much bandwidth we're going to give this type of traffic. We can also use it for provisioning. Now, check this out. Uh, let's say that, again, we're, we're this big multi-site enterprise organization, and we're going to be deploying routers, switches in locations all around the country or all around the world. What we can do is we can order the device from Cisco and we get the serial number and the informa uh, information from Cisco and we have it sent to wherever it's going to be installed. And we just have somebody at that site plug it in and turn it on. When they turn it on, you've got it already configured in DNA Center. It's going to boot up, and when it goes out to get an IP address via DHCP, in addition to the IP address, it's going to say, and here's the address of a TFTP server. Ah, what's it going to get from a TFTP server? It's configuration. It can download its configuration automatically. That's pretty cool. And also with provisioning, we're able to push out changes you know, on the fly. So we can say, all right, I want to apply this policy and I want to add this device. But you know, I think one of the coolest things is we're able to, uh, to just have devices installed kind of on the fly. Another category is assurance. Now, when you hear assurance, I want you to think troubleshooting because this has some of the most robust troubleshooting features I've ever seen. Uh, for one thing, uh, this is, to be honest, I haven't heard Cisco really come out and say this, but just observation, this seems to be replacing the Cisco APIC EM uh, network controller because it does a lot of the same stuff. For example, the APIC EM network controller, it's got something called the APIC EM path trace ACL analysis tool where you can say, what if I were sending traffic from point A to point B? Would it get there? If not, is it blocked by an access control list? And if it is, what is that? where does that list live? What does that entry say that's blocking my traffic? And it gives you that level of detail so you can see why your traffic's not getting through. DNA Center does that too. It's got that feature built in as well. It's also got something called network time travel, which sounds kind of fun. Network time travel says, we can go back in time and see the performance metrics of the network at some time in the past. So maybe we come in one morning, we realized, uh oh, something bad went down at like 3.30 a.m. I wonder what the network was looking like at 3.30 a.m. while I was asleep. Well, using network time travel, we can look at it. We can go back in time and say, show me the, the performance metrics at 3.30 a.m. and we can see what's going on there. And when the, and it's going to continually monitor for alerts and let us know when alerts and events happen, and it's going to give us suggestions uh, suggestions for fixing those issues. And the suggestions they didn't just say, "All right, here's you know, <laughs> un unplug and replug your device in," or something you might get from a technical support line. No, they worked very closely with TAC, and they took a ton of uh, Cisco Technical Assist uh, Assistance Center cases, and they built this knowledge base. And uh, things that TAC keeps hearing about, they built those solutions into this assurance area. But maybe one of the coolest and most powerful things about Cisco DNA Center is it acts as a programmability platform. Now, we're going to be talking a bit more about SDN, Software Defined Networking, later today. But the, and that's where we're going to be able to write programs, maybe in Python, to reach out to a network controller and express our intent. I'd like to have this traffic prioritized. I'd like to have this traffic blocked. I'd like to have this traffic have this much bandwidth available, and so on. 
Well, we can have these application programming interfaces, these APIs that come with Cisco DNA Center, and I'll show them to you later, uh, later today. And we can write our programs to go out and and get information and push change information out to the Cisco DNA Center. It's really a network controller that can be used in an SDN environment. Again, kind of taking the place of the APIC EM, in my opinion. In fact, for your notes, please write this down because Cisco has one solution that's primarily for the data center. It's called ACI for your notes. That stands for Application Centric Infrastructure. And ACI has a bunch of different pieces and parts. For example, it's got a controller called the APIC controller, and it's going to manage your Nexus devices in your data center. So think of ACI as being your data center management solution. Think of Cisco DNA Center as being your enterprise management solution. So again, ACI for data center, DNA center for the enterprise. Now, what I would love to do is take you out and show you how to uh, how to do some basic stuff or just kind of give you a tour, but I thought you might want to do it on your own. So if you want to take a screen cap of this, you're welcome to do so. Uh, the, the great folks over at uh, Cisco DevNet, what, a, what an amazing group within Cisco. Uh, I'm just so impressed with what they've done for the community and they, uh, they have the DevNet Sandbox where they make a lot of uh, really expensive gear available for our use so we can go in and experiment with it and learn on it. And uh, they've done the same thing with Cisco DNA Center. So uh, hats off once again to the DevNet folks. But what you can do is go to one of these two URLs. Uh, I, I typically go to the one that has read-write access because I might want to do something. I might want to configure something. There's another one with read-only access. But we're going to be going to Sandbox DNAC for DNA Center, obviously, .cisco.com. We're going to log in with the username of DevNet user. And you see the password on screen. Let's... Uh, Let's go out and take a look at, <coughs> pardon me, let's go out and take a look at Cisco DNA Center. Uh, here it is, I'm gonna get logged in. And sometimes it's really, really fast in response, And but if there are some several users at the same time, sometimes it's really, really slow. And since I just handed out the login credentials to, let's see, how many people do we have online now? Let's just do a quick check. We've got 321 joining us through uh, the, um, KW Train Portal, we've got 361 through YouTube. So right now online, we've got uh, we've got we've got 680 some people watching online right now. So it's uh, it might get a little sluggish for us. But here's the main interface, and under Design, we can see a map of the world like I was talking about. Now I'm in the United States, so I might go down to the United States East area. And I could say that I wanted to, uh, let me open it and see what we have already. There's one for Washington, D.C. But let's say that I want to add an area. Now, the, the city I'm in is in Richmond, Kentucky. And we'll add that area. And I could add another area there, but I'll just add a building. I can say that within Richmond, Kentucky, we've got uh, the worldwide headquarters of Kevin Wallace Training. So I'll say that... The building name is KW Train HQ. And it wants a longitude and latitude. I'll just kind of point to the map and, and guess because I have no idea what my longitude and latitude is. Uh, oh, uh, totally. <laughs> I think I'm in Indiana somewhere, but uh, or Illinois or maybe, maybe Missouri. Anyway, you get the idea. We could then go into this building. Or I could then add a... Uh, I could then... go into this building and I could add a floor plan. So I could say, add a floor plan. Now, I don't have a floor plan to, enter, uh, to import, but I could, and you know what, just to be a good network citizen, I wanna delete what I just did. Let me delete that area. Don't wanna leave a footprint behind, so give me just a few seconds so I don't clutter up the DevNet sandbox because I really do appreciate what they're doing and I don't wanna make it harder for anybody else to use. All right, now let me just get rid of that one area and we'll move on. So under Richmond, Kentucky, we'll say, delete. 
And uh, that's what I was saying when we could, uh, when I said that we could actually document and diagram our entire network. Now, under policy, here's where we could do things like group-based access control, IP-based access control. Uh, one of my favorites, though, is if we go under application and we can say queuing profile. And under queuing profile, we can say how much bandwidth do we want to make available for different applications. Uh, and we can have these different categories of applications. <coughs> Pardon me. I can get a drink here. Uh, we could do this, uh, we could assign bandwidth values to different uh, classes of traffic. We could assign bandwidth values to different DSCP values. Pretty cool. Under provisioning, uh, this is where we can go in and uh, we could add devices. Now here are devices that are already assigned. I could go into unassigned devices. I could add a new device. So if I wanted to order a new router for another site, I could do that here. I would put in the serial number and set up everything. And when it got there, they just plug it in. It, it would know exactly its, its purpose in life in the network. Assurance, this is all about troubleshooting, we said. And right now it looks like my health is good. But if I did have issues, we could see them here and it would give me remediation suggestions for that. And finally, under platform, this is where we're going to be able to do programming. Uh, we'll be able to write Python programs or repurpose others' Python programs to go ahead and do some configuration. So check this out. Under developer toolkit, APIs, and it gives us a plethora of application programming interfaces that we are going to be able to use. And it's slowing down a little bit right now because we've got a lot of people logged on. Wow, it's really slowing down. But uh, let's just take the first one. Uh, here's one called Get Site Health. This is an API. If I wanted to just uh, write a Python program to go out and get an overall snapshot of the site health of, uh, of my DNA center, I can do that. It lets you do a preview of the code. It lets you try it out. But um, anyway, lots of programming interfaces there. Here, here today, we don't have to know how to do actual configurations or anything like that. And you don't for the exam either. The exam just really wants you to know what DNA Center is, where does it fit into the network. Uh, and it's going to be your management solution for the enterprise. Just wanted to give you a little bit of a tour there. So that's the first of the five topics we're going to be covering today. Coming up next, we've got wireless LAN security. Now, the previous version of this is or the previous version of the CCNA exam covered some wireless, but it was very, very light, to be honest. Uh, you know what? Let me, I'm trying to bring my, well, let me bring my camera back up here. I feel, I feel disconnected from you guys if I, if I cannot, I know I cannot see you, but I just feel like it's a more intimate discussion if you can see me. So I'm going to try to push my camera back out there so that we can have, uh, we can have a face-to-face -face conversation. But with wireless land security, we do a lot more with, wireless networks than we did in the previous version of the CCNA. Uh, in the previous version, you basically had to know the difference between uh, managing wireless access points individually, that was in autonomous mode, or managing them from a network, con uh, a wireless LAN controller, and that was called the lightweight mode. But uh, it goes way, way, way deeper because there's not, this is not just the route switch NA anymore. This is just the more generic NA. So you've got to know a lot more about wireless. And uh, in the actual course, we get into all the new stuff like Wi-Fi 6 and orthogonal, uh, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, or orthogonal uh, frequency division multiple access. And uh, we get really geeky. Uh, we geek out on that stuff. It's pretty cool. But um, I thought today we would talk about wireless LAN security. Now think about the need for wireless LAN security for a second. If you had a big corporate building like this, would you put an Ethernet jack in the parking lot where somebody could just drive up and they could plug into your corporate network? That would be insane, wouldn't it? Because that's not secure. But that's really what a lot of companies might be doing if they have an unsecured wireless LAN because somebody could just pull up in the parking lot and start receiving traffic coming from the corporate network. So we've got two big goals for a wireless LAN. Number one, we want to do authentication. Whoever's connecting to the wireless LAN, we want to make sure that they are who they claim to be, that they're allowed to be on this network. And then once they are, they've been authenticated 
and they start sending data across the, the airwaves, we want to make sure that if anybody intercepts that data, they're not going to be able to make any sense of it because it's all scrambled up. It's been encrypted. So let's talk about how we're going to do authentication and encryption for our wireless networks. To go back in time just a little bit, uh, back in the original standard, back in the 802.11 standard, there was a, uh, a <laughs> I even hesitate to call it a security protocol because it's so... It's so bad. Uh, it's called WEP, Wired Equivalent Privacy. Now, the name suggests that it gives you the equivalent privacy of having a wired connection. That's not true at all. It's a very weak encryption. It was part of the original standard, and it was based on the RC4 encryption algorithm. Now, RC4 in itself, to be fair, isn't bad. Um, it's the way it was implemented in WEP. We, we go a lot deeper in the, in the actual course, but to give you the high-level overview, with WEP, there's a 24-bit string called an initialization vector, or an IV. And then you've got your, your key, the, the secret key that you type in on your computer, and, this, and, you, and it matches on your wireless access point. Well, what it does, it takes that initialization vector and it takes that key that you type in and doing some Boolean mathematics, it's going to merge those together with the data to be encrypted and it creates ciphertext. And it's all scrambled up. I couldn't read it, but you can mathematically determine if you capture enough packets, you can mathematically determine what that key is because there's what's called collisions. Uh, there, there would be different strings that would generate the same encrypted string simply because the initialization vector is too short. And in a fairly busy network, on average, it's about three and a half minutes. If you capture enough packets in about three and a half minutes, you can mathematically determine what that key is. So it is super, super weak. We never want to use WEP in our environment. It is trivial to, uh, to crack that. And I said that we're going to have a key that we type in maybe on our computer and we also put a matching key on the wireless access point and uh, they have to match. They're, we're using symmetric encryption. But the question is, how do I get the keys on those different devices? Well, in our home, what we typically do is we use the mode called uh, the pre-shared key mode or the personal mode. With the personal, uh, personal mode, uh, we are going to manually enter the, well, there's something called uh, WPS that we'll get to. But generally, what I will do is I will manually type in, here's the secret key on the access point. Here's the secret key on my laptop. Here's the secret key on my, on my phone. And that's the way that I get the keys spread around all the devices in my home. But in an enterprise, that's not scalable, is it? You don't want to just have one key that you tell every employee. That's going to get leaked out. And uh, what if somebody leaves? Somebody leaves the company, they're a disgruntled employee, uh, you don't want them on your network, what do you do? Go change the key on all your devices? Yeah, the pre-shared key mode might be great for your home, but it's not great for the enterprise. So there's another option called enterprise mode. With enterprise mode, we're going to have a key that's going to be valid for a specific session. Here's what I mean by that. We're going to have an authentication server. Typically, it's a radius server. And when we try to come on the network, we're this wireless client called the supplicant. These are 802.1x terms, by the way. But the supplicant, that's the device that wants to gain access to the network. And it reaches out and, say, uh, and says, hey, can I join the network? Well, the radius server challenges it, and they have a little back and forth conversation. And if the supplicant authenticates itself, the radius server says, okay, they're good people. Let's let them on the network. And the radio server is going to generate a key that's all, it's not good for anybody else. It's only good for this client for the duration of the session. It's called a session key. And we're going to give that session key, the radio server gives that session key to the client and to the access point. And they're able to encrypt traffic because they're the only ones that have that key. If anybody intercepts it, they're not going to be able to make any sense out of it. That's the way that we can distribute the keys in a home or, or a small office, home office environment versus the enterprise. But we still got the issue of, of WEP is, it's bad. What do we do? What's better than WEP? Well, let's take a look at how things evolved from WEP. Since, since that basic RC4 thing just wasn't great. Uh, 
the wireless manufacturers started using something called TKIP, Temporal Key Integrity Protocol. Now, Cisco tried to do their own thing. They, they had CKIP, but we won't get into all that stuff. Uh, but uh, Temporal Key Integrity Protocol was much better. To be fair, it was much better than, uh, than WEP was. Uh, it, um, it had a longer initialization vector. It still used an initialization vector, but it was a lot longer. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a moment. But really, the flagship encryption algorithm out there, even today, is AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. It's not only better than TKIP, it's, it's vastly superior to RC4. So we started to see these wireless protocols other than WEP that would give us better authentication and encryption. Here are those protocols that you need to know for the exam. The first one was called WPA, Wi-Fi Protected Access, and it used TKIP for encryption. So it's better already than, uh, than WEP because we're using TKIP. You might say, why didn't we just use AES? And here's the reason. Processing power. While AES is great when it comes to security, it takes, uh, it, it's a heavy lift. It takes some processing power to, uh, to do all the encryption and decryption. And some of the wireless devices that were out there during these days, this is around the early 2000s, it would just bog down the wireless devices. So if we didn't want to put too much processor burden on our devices, we could use WPA, better than WEP, and it didn't put the processor burden that, that came with AES. And that allowed us to use existing hardware. We didn't have to upgrade the hardware. We could just upgrade the software. And the way it was better, it used a 48-bit instead of a 24-bit initialization vector. Now, that doesn't mean it's just twice as... It's just twice as secure. It's orders of magnitude more secure and more difficult to break. But uh, we really want to start moving toward AES. And that's what happened with WPA2. Because, yeah, the, the, suddenly, or not suddenly, but very quickly, WPA became vulnerable to attack as well. And WPA2 came out. And the Wi-Fi Alliance, they're the, they're the organization that certifies devices as, as quote-unquote, Wi-Fi compliant. Well... They had a requirement that said, if you want to be certified as WPA2, you must support AES. Uh, in fact, as of 2006, if you wanted to be certified as WPA2, you had to support AES, but you didn't have to use it. Back in 2006, there were still devices that would suffer from a processor overload, or not an overload, but it would really bog things down if you tried to use AES. So you had an option. You could, you could do it. By definition, WPA2 supported AES, but you didn't have to use it. You could just use TKIP if you wanted to because it required more processing power than WPA. And this was really the go-to wireless encryption standard for like a decade. It was amazing. But a few years ago, back in 2016, there was a, another vulnerability discovered. And uh, this vulnerability was called Crack, uh, spelt with a K. And it made WPA2 susceptible to attack. And uh, it's, it's a pretty interesting read if you want to read exactly how Crack works. And it's... Uh, People get really creative when they want to when they want to break into stuff. But there is a vulnerability, unfortunately, in WPA2. So dump to dump to the rescue comes. You guessed it, WPA3. And with WPA3, we've got several enhancements. Now there's some there's some mumblings out on the internet right now, or rumblings that there are weaknesses in WPA3. And originally that was true. But kind of behind the scenes, there were a few little weaknesses and they didn't make those widely publicized, but the manufacturers are fixing those. So yeah, I think WPE3 is going to be around for a while. I mean, WPE2 was around for a decade, but for, for the enterprise mode, now this doesn't apply to personal mode, but for enterprise mode, it gives us a longer AES key. It's a whopping 192 bits. In personal mode, it's still what it used to be, which is 128 bits. And it, uh, it, one of the attacks that people might launch against some of the older gear is they would send management frames into the access controller itself, pretending to be like a, an administrative person that's trying to get in and do administrative configuration on the access point. Well, we can protect against that because it uses something called protected management frames. 
And if somebody was going to do a brute force attack and just try all kinds of passwords to try to get in to this access point, well, that's been prevented or at least made much more difficult using something called the Simultaneous Authentication of Equals, SAE. Now that sounds complicated, but it really breaks down to this. It means in order to try a password, you're not just talking to the access point. You're having to establish communication with the network. You're not able to just try like 10,000 passwords and see if you get in. No, that's not going to happen because you have to actually have some back and forth conversation uh, with, uh, with the network. So there's no offline attacks possible here. And have you ever been one, uh, concerned about, I've been concerned about being in an airport or a coffee shop where there's public Wi-Fi and you get on the network. What's to prevent somebody else from just sniffing your frames? I usually fire up a VPN on my laptop to prevent that from happening, but um, that's built in. That protection in public uh, areas, that's built into WPA3. And I mentioned uh, WPS earlier. Uh, this was a way with uh, WPA2 where if you had a brand new device, you get your fresh new laptop out of the box, you want to, you want to add it to your home network, there was a little button on the front of your access point in your home. And... It allowed you to press that button and it would allow you to then go to that device and it would join the network without you having to go into all the configuration uh, configuration pages. And uh, so WPS has been replaced with Device Provisioning Protocol or DPP. And I want to show you how to configure this because there is a specific element on the uh, or specific topic on the CCNA blueprint that tells you exactly what kind of wireless LAN security you need to you need to configure, and uh, I noticed somebody said, "Hey, this this is like A plus material we're covering here. What's up?" Uh, well, the, I, I'm trying to give you the theory of five brand new topics on the CCNA exam. The CCNA exam is chock full of configuration stuff. You're configuring OSPF version two. There's a lot of heavy duty configuration here, but in like a one to two hour webinar, I'm doing my best to, uh, to give you the new topics and teach you what you need to know about these new topics for the exam. So, uh, yeah, uh, my apologies if you uh, if you don't feel this the technical depth of this is uh, at the level you were expecting. I assure you that the full blown course is. I'm just trying to get you familiar with the the five topics that I've identified as really cool topics on the new exam. Now here's what Cisco says that we should that we should be able to do security wise on the new exam. They want us to go into an interface like this. This is a Cisco wireless LAN controller. And uh, we want to be able to configure, this is on the blueprint, it says we need to be able to configure WPA2 with a pre-shared key. Okay, very simple to do. All we're going to do is go under the uh, WLANs, the wireless LANs option. We're going to go into the particular wireless LAN that we're told to go into on the exam if we have to configure this on the exam. And we go into security. So WLANs, go into the wireless LAN, go to security. Now under layer two security, we've got options. <laughs> we've got WEP, let's not use WEP ever. Uh, we could turn it off altogether. We could use none, we could use uh, some Cisco proprietary stuff. Or what we wanna do is we wanna select WPA plus WPA2. Now just because it says WPA plus WPA2, that doesn't mean we're turning on WPA. It's just that's the option we have to select to then say what type of WPA we're going to be using. Notice we can select WPA policy with this checkbox right here, but uh, I, I didn't. I'm not going to use WPA. I'm going to use WPA too, so that is checked. Now remember, TKIP was used because there were devices that would be bogged down processor-wise if they were running AES. So we could support either one. We can check both boxes. In older devices, they can use TKIP. Newer devices can use AES. We can turn off AES altogether. But what I'll probably do with modern networks, I'm assuming everybody's had time to upgrade by now. I mean, it's been since 2006. Uh, so I'm gonna choose AES. And for the, uh, the key management protocol, we're gonna use PSK. That's pre-shared key. And we're gonna give our key and I'll say, I'll type in my super secret key and we'll click apply. And that's it. That is doing, uh, that is one complete task on the, uh, on the exam blueprint. 
but I needed to give you a little backstory of what, what the different uh, flavors of WPA were all about. So that was, I guess that was our second of second of, uh, of five different topics. The next one is, uh, is on JSON formatting. Now, JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And before we get into that, because that's used in uh, software-defined networks a lot, software-defined networking, I need you to understand how it's going to be used. So I want to take just a little bit of a step back here and talk uh, for a few moments about uh, about SDN, software defined networking. This is a new, this is a massive paradigm shift. This is going to be dramatically altering how we do our day to day jobs as network administrators in the future. So here's the idea. Traditionally, we had our routers and switches, and they have three different control planes. They've got the uh, they've got the data plane, the control plane in the management plane. Now down at the data plane, oh well, let's start at the management plane. The management plane is how we as administrators connect into that device. Maybe it's via secure shell, maybe it's via telnet, hopefully it's not telnet, that's not secure. Maybe a secure shell, but it's uh, SNMP, that counts. Uh, simple network management protocol. It's how we administratively talk to the device. And the management plane gets us into the device and the control plane, that is going to run the protocols, like on a router, it's going to run the routing protocols of OSPF or something like that. Or the uh, with a switch, that's where Spanning Tree Protocol is doing its calculations. The, those calculations and uh, configurations, they happen at the control plane. And then at the data plane, we're concerned about getting data from point A to point B. So the, the packets of the data plane or the frames of the data plane, they're going to consult the routing table, the MAC address table, whatever logic we've constructed at the control plane to see where do I go from here? What's my egress interface? And this model is called a distributed control plane because the control planes are distributed amongst all of our different devices. But with the advent of SDN, we can now have this controller and we can have the control planes all go live inside of the controller. And this controller itself, it can do all the calculations. It can run the Dijkstra algorithm and, and do all those things for us and then push that information down to the managed devices. That is called a centralized control plane because we've centralized it and that communication is going to use an API. That's a term for your notes. An API, that's an application programming interface. And that's just how one piece of software talks to another piece of software. And if we're talking from the controller going down to the managed devices, we typically call those southbound APIs or southbound interfaces. The reason we say it's south is uh, we normally draw the controller kind of in the middle and we draw the managed devices down below and they're they're south of us. They're south of the controller. We're, so we're pointing down, we're pointing south. That's for, therefore they're southbound APIs. And this again is, go, uh, they're gonna be abbreviated SBIs. That means southbound APIs. And this is our centralized control plane structure where the control plane lives in the SDN controller. And an example of a southbound API, one that's in, kind of an industry standard, is called OpenFlow. Cisco has their own that can work with Nexus switches called OpFlex, but that's, a, that's an example of a southbound API. Well, how do we get instructions to the controller itself? Well, we're going to have an application that's going to allow us to express our intent. And that intent is going to be pushed down to the controller. And uh, that intent might be to set a quality. Oh, well, quick example. Let's say that, um, let's say we're an e-commerce company and we're going to be running a, an ad on the big game. Did you know it's actually a copyright violation for me to say the name of that really big football game that happens in the winter? But you know what I'm talking about. The one with the really expensive commercials. Let's say we're going to run a really expensive commercial on the big game, and we expect a, a huge influx of orders coming into our uh, coming into our customer service center. And in order to do that, we need to spin up some other virtual machines. We need to set up load balancing on our Cisco routers. We might need to change quality service policy. There's a lot of configuration to do. It would take a long time to do that to do, do those things individually. But we could just push that, that instruction down to the SDN controller and it's going to then blow it out or, or, and send it out to all the devices. Now think about this. This blows my mind. 
if I'm setting up a quality of service policy to give priority treatment and a certain amount of bandwidth to a particular application, the, the actual instructions are different on a router as compared to a switch. I don't have to get into the minutia of knowing what those commands are. I just express my intent through an application to the controller and it knows what applications are, it knows what commands to use. It's, it gives us tremendous scalability in order to do that. And since the applications sit above the controller, we're gonna say that the application communicates using a northbound interface with the controller. It's bi-directional communication, and that's abbreviated as NBI, northbound, inter, uh, northbound interfaces. And the, the northbound interfaces specifically are called REST APIs, or some literature will call them RESTful APIs. But REST, for your notes, R-E-S-T, that stands for Representational State Transfer. Here's what that means. It means if I want to get information from the controller, I'm going to use an HTTP verb to do that, like get. It's literally, it's like talking to a web server. When you talk to a web server, you're sending like uh, like post or delete or get. You're sending all these HTTP verbs to communicate with the SDN controller. That's what a REST API is. It's a series of those HTTP verbs that's sending information back and forth. And that information has to be formatted in a certain way. And that's where JSON comes in. JSON is, again, that stands for JavaScript Object Notation. That's going to be the format that this data is going to be exchanged in. And a topic on the CCN exam is to understand JSON formatting. And we're, going to, and we're getting to that. That's the next slide. We'll, we'll start getting into that. And uh, XML is used sometimes as well, but the exam specifically wants you to know about JSON formatting, and that's what we want to get into right now. So let's talk about the JSON or JavaScript object notation format. To, uh, if you look at some of this information, because you can be looking at a network controller and you can say, for example, on an APIC, you can say, "Yeah, show me the uh, show me the uh, show me the JSON code that's doing this configuration," and it's it's lengthy, it's complex, it goes down multiple levels. But I want to simplify it for you. When you're looking at some JSON formatted data, it only has two different things that you're looking at. There's only two different types of information you're looking at with a JSON formatted uh, data set. Two basic structures. One is simply a collection of name value pairs. A name is kind of like a variable, and then you've got the value for that variable. That is called an object. And you also have an ordered list of values. This is called an array. So it's like maybe the IP addresses of a bunch of your devices. Well, let me give you, let's be more specific about this. Let's first of all, take a look at, uh, at our objects. We said that an object was, uh, was a set of name value pairs and there are no particular order. And you're going to recognize an object. Remember, there's only two kinds of uh, two kinds of data structures we have. We're going to be able to recognize an object because it's going to be in curly brackets, not straight brackets. It's going to be in curly brackets. And here's an example. Here's my first. Oh, I've got first name, last name. Now the name is first name, and it's in quotes. There's a colon followed by the value of first name, and it's in quotes, and it's Kevin. So we'll, we're saying my first name is Kevin, and then we have another name value pair, and that's separated with a comma. We're saying last name, in quotes, colon, Wallace. My last name is Wallace. And then we close the curly brackets. Now, this isn't, this is super simple. I'm only giving you a couple of examples. But if you get into a really, really large object, it could be a little bit unwieldy. So you typically want to see this written with white space involved. And that's what we're doing here. We have the curly brackets on their own lines and each name value pair is on an individual line, still separated with a comma, by the way. Let's take a look at the other type of data entity that we have. And we said that that was an array. An array is an ordered set of comma separated values and they're in straight brackets instead of the curly brackets. Let me give an example. Here are some of the uh, new certifications that Cisco just released. 
uh, the brand new CCNA that we're talking about right now, CCP Enterprise and CC, uh, CCIE Enterprise Infrastructure. Okay, not a lot of white space in there, so we might want to write it like this just to make it a little bit more readable because that's one of the driving forces behind JSON. We want to make it readable by humans. And it would look like this with the white space inserted. Now, those were super simple examples, I admit. Uh, and the values that I used were all strings. Just to make it easy to visualize, I, I just used text strings. But a value not only could be a string, it could be a number. And here's where it really gets interesting. The, the, the value you have in an object could be an object itself. So you could have an object nested in an object, nested in another object. That's where it gets a little cumbersome to decipher. But I just want you to know it all breaks down to just two types of information. We've got objects and arrays. And if you want to go out and check your JSON data, uh, which is way beyond the scope of what you need for the CCNA exam, by the way, uh, in order to do this, I recommend going out to uh, jsonlint.com. In fact, let me show it to you. Let's go out to our live interface once again. And that object I created earlier, let me paste, uh, I'll just paste that in here where it's got first name Kevin, last name Wallace. I'm going to say validate JSON and it puts the white space in there for me. And it shows me that uh, that's what it would look like with all the white space. Again, for the, uh, for the exam, they're not asking you to program in Python. They're not asking you to debug uh, a, a big JSON uh, data set. They just want you to understand how things are formatted. And it's going to be simple if you just remember that the, uh, the objects, they're in curly brackets, name value pair, and then we have an ordered list of values inside of straight brackets, and that's our array. All right, kind of sticking with the, uh, kind of sticking with our SDN topic right now, let's talk about the specific HTTP, uh, HTTP verbs that we want to use. And uh, the acronym that we use to help us remember those is, uh, I don't think this is a very pleasant sounding word, but it's called crud. <laughs> I guess uh, back in back when I was a kid, people used to ter uh, use the term cruddy. Oh, that, that looks cruddy. Well, crud is the acronym we're going to use to tell us or, and help us remember what uh, verbs we want to use. Now, now, let's go back to what we talked about earlier. We said that an application is going to send REST APIs down to the controller. And we said those were simply HTTP verbs. But here's the challenge. Programmers might get creative and try to do things. Well, I'm going to use this verb. This is my favorite verb to use when I'm updating data. And here's my favorite verb to use when I'm retrieving data. And if different programmers, different coders use their own favorite verbs, it's going to be hard. that that code is going to become less portable. It's going to be harder for somebody else to interpret what somebody else did. So it would be great if we had kind of a standard. And that's what CRUD gives us. CRUD is all about giving us a standard for what verbs we're going to be using. And this really goes back to the database days. This acronym of CRUD goes back when people were doing database programming years and years ago. The C in CRUD stands for create. We're creating a value. Uh, the R stands for read. We're retrieving information from a value. The U stands for update. There's an existing value. I'm just changing that value. And the D is for delete. And we put that all together and that gives us the acronym of CRUD. Now, here are the best practice recommendations. And you'll see some variants on this. This is not written in stone. But in general, here's what's agreed upon by the coders. If you're going to do a create operation, your verb is post. Read is get. Update is put. And D is delete. That's what, so when you're looking through that uh, exam blueprint and you see crud, it's not that bad. <laughs> the, uh, it's, uh, it's just telling us which verbs to use. Uh, by the way, just a, a side comment about the, the new NA exam. Of course, nobody's going to know until somebody actually goes and takes it on, uh, on February the 24th. But just based on the blueprint, honestly, this looks dare I say easier than the, than the current CCNA. It certainly has less content in it. It got rid of a lot of the more advanced topics like uh, RIP, 
Not that RIP is advanced. I'm just naming some uh, topics they removed. RIP is gone. Um, OSPF version 3 is gone. Version 2 is still there. Uh, BGP is gone. EIGRP is gone. Uh, IPSLA is gone. So I think, I'm guessing, I'm predicting, it's going to be, it's not going to be easy, but I think it's going to be a more realistic exam. I love this new blueprint. I think it's an appropriate level for, for NA, uh, NA candidates. Now, for our final topic, we want to talk about some configuration management tools. And uh, configuration management tools that they give us are um, Puppet, Chef, and Ansible. And before we get into those, I thought it would really be useful for us to understand where they fit into what's called the DevOps lifecycle. Now, the DevOps lifecycle is, well, let's, let's define DevOps first of all. For years in IT, there was one group uh, for the developers uh, and there was another group for the operations, the people who actually maintained the servers and the routers and the switches. And you've got this other group of coders over here. They, uh, unfortunately, in a lot of organizations for years, they kind of worked in silos, and they they would do their thing, and occasionally they would pass some code over to the to the IT operations people, and they would deploy it. But there was a lot of finger pointing. It that, it wasn't there wasn't a lot of synergy. There wasn't a lot of teamwork going on. But now there's this new model called the DevOps model of the DevOps lifecycle. It's really a way of thinking where we're bringing the development people together with the operations people. And that's where we get the term DevOps. And with DevOps, uh, we're going to uh, go through a few different phases. For example, we're going to start off, and we can start anywhere, but we're going to start off, let's say, with planning. Planning is saying, here's what I need this network application to do. I need it to go out and... Uh, and and change a quality service setting, or I need it to monitor something and give me feedback. That we're saying what we need an application to do. Then the coder, after the planning, they're going to code that application. In the build phase, they're merging what they created in with the existing software and make sure nothing breaks. But before we just roll it out, uh, we're going to go into a testing phase uh, for, because even though something looks good in the laboratory until you actually do some quality assurance, it's uh, it could break. Uh, oh wow! I'm I'm having a flashback to the ordeal I've gone through the last few days because uh, I run a Mac and uh, Catalina just came out last week and I installed it on my iMac Pro and I've got a couple of external monitors and and that was the that caused the issue. But uh, it, every few minutes or every few hours it would do a hard crash. It would just boom. It would just go down uh, because it wasn't thoroughly tested in this DevOps lifecycle. But uh, yeah, the, the testing makes sure that it's not going to break anything. And then we say we hand it over to the operations people and say, all right, go ahead and deploy it in the network. That's the release phase, the handoff. And then we're going to deploy. Now, we're going to return to deploy in a moment. That's where these configuration management tools come in. And we're going to then let it run. We're going to operate it and just kind of monitor it and see, hey, is it, is it breaking anything? Is everything cool here? And if everything is cool, then... Uh, yeah, we'll just keep it. Uh, but we do that in the monitoring phase, but then we just circle through it all again. Based on what's happening, what do we want next? What are we going to, uh, uh, what do we want to plan for next? That's the DevOps lifecycle. But going back to that deploy phase, that's where we have these configuration management tools. And that's what Cisco tells us we need to know for the exam. Now, when you're looking at Cisco's exam blueprint, uh, it's really it's really useful if you will pay attention to the verbs they use in the description. They might say you want to be able to configure OSPF version 2, or you want to verify this, or describe this. Like, uh, In fact, there's re there really isn't a trouble, not that I can remember, I don't think there's a troubleshoot verb on the new blueprint. The old one had, yeah, you need to be able to troubleshoot point-to-point uh, -point protocol connections was one of the examples. Troubleshoot means you need that in-depth understanding. You need to know how to set it up and figure out what's wrong and make it work again. So pay attention to the verbs. That's going to tell you the level you need to understand something. And when it comes to these configuration management utilities, it's not much. It's very, very high level. In fact, I wrote it down here. I want to give you the exact verbiage. The blueprint says for these three uh, configuration management tools, a puppet, chef, and ansible, here it is right out of the blueprint. It says you need to be able to recognize the characteristics of. You don't need to know how to configure them. You don't need to know how to code in uh, in Chef, uh, or, or actually it uses Ruby. You don't need to be a Ruby coder. You don't even, 
you don't even need to know a whole lot of detail. You just need to know what do they do. Again, it's recognize the characteristics of. That's it. And, and even when you get into your NP studies, if you go in and get your uh, your Encore exam next after this, uh, just for fun, I went and checked that out today. In the Encore exam, when they talk about this very same topic, the Encore exam says, and I quote, if I can find it, Where is it? Oh yeah, here it goes. Uh, it says for the Encore exam, compare, compare agent versus agentless uh, utilities. So for example, we're gonna be talking about Puppet and Chef having an agent, and we'll talk about Ansel being agentless. You're just comparing the characteristics even at the NP level. You don't know how to code this stuff. So please don't be thrown when I show you a little snippet of code. I'm just doing that for example. You don't know how to, you don't, don't need to be able to create that on your own. So please do not be concerned about that. Now, with Puppet, as I hinted at earlier, it's written in Ruby. Even if you want to get into this, you don't have to be a Ruby expert to get into this. And you're going to be able to declare a resource. A couple of examples. A resource might be an interface that you're going to configure. A resource might be uh, an OSPF process that you want to configure. It's something that you're going to be configuring. That's a resource. And you declare that resource. And then you create a class. A class is a set of configuration instructions for that resource. So we might be adding an IP address. But, uh, we might be adding an IP address to the interface. We might be we might be setting a, a passive interface for an OSPF process. We would do that with a class. They're saying here are the configuration settings for those resources, and then we have the manifest. The manifest is the that's the big section of code that gets pushed out to the devices. And it's going to contain these classes. It's go, okay, here's the configuration for this interface. Here's the configuration for this and this and this. That's contained in a manifest and that gets pushed out. And a manifest is going to combine all this configuration to give us one primary task. And we're going to have a collection of these manifests that we store for use later on in something called a module. A module is just a repository for the manifest. So let's take a look at this in action. Let's say that, uh, oh, first of all, yeah, this is an agent-based utility. So we're installing a Puppet server on some server, and then we need to have agents on the devices that we're managing. So we install agents on, here I'm using Cisco Nexus devices. Notice I'm not using something like our ISR 2900 series routers because they're not able to do this. And the reason I say they're not able to do this, we're, you're not able to install a Puppet agent uh, on, uh, on your 2900 routers. Now, I'm trying to tell you what you need to know for the exam. If you start looking at some of the stuff in development, yes, there actually are some agentless Puppet solutions out there. Don't think about that for the exam. We just need to know agent versus agentless. This is an agent-based uh, configuration management utility for exam purposes. Yes, there's there's some agentless stuff coming along for Puppet. Don't think about that. Think about it as you need an agent. But these Nexus switches, they actually run, uh, they have a place where you have Linux installed. Uh, it's called a guest shell within your Nexus switch. And it's running, I think it's, uh, I think the variant of Linux that it's running is called CentOS, I think it's version 7. You can install stuff on that. You can install Linux apps like this puppet agent. And let's say that we want uh, we want the configuration of all these Nexus switches to be in a particular state. And we'll just call that state B. That's a set of configurations. Well, what we can do is we can have some bi-directional communication to see, hey, what's your state right now? And if you're not in state B, then I've got this manifest full of instructions that I'm going to push out to you. So we, uh, and here's just an example. Again, you don't need to know how to do this for the exam, but I think it's pretty readable. I, I'm not a Ruby person, but I think this is pretty readable. I can see that we're going into interface ethernet one slash four, and we're currently shut down because that's set to true. And I see that we're setting an IP address of 172.16.1.24 uh, with a slash 19 subnet mask. Yeah, if I'm, if I'm trying to do this in the real world, I'm gonna be looking at an example like this for guidance. And I'll just learn more as I as I do more. And I'll have to look at fewer and fewer examples. But we're going to go out and have this bi-directional communication and say, hey, what's your state right now? Now, let's say that the state 
of our top and bottom switches, they're in state A, we'll say. It's not the state we want. The middle one, it's in state B. That is what we want. So we're going to push out a copy of the manifest to the top and bottom switches while not touching that middle switch. That's an example of how Puppet works. Chef, very similar. Chef is also written in Ruby. But being a chef, it uses the the the, the cooking metaphor. <laughs> really, all, they go all in on the chef metaphor here. Their set of configuration instructions is called a recipe. And if you've got a grouping of these configuration instructions, you've got a grouping of recipes. Where would you put a group of recipes? That's right, in a cookbook. A cookbook is a collection of recipes. And uh, there's literally, you can download this from Cisco, there's literally something called a Cisco cookbook that you're going to install on your Chef server. And again, this is an agent-based uh, utility. So that means we're going to be installing Chef clients on our Nexus switches. And yes, there's some stuff in the works to make it agentless as well, but don't think about that for the exam. Think of this as an agent-based. And what we're going to do is with this bidirectional communication, we're going to be able to take our, uh, from our cookbook, we're going to select a recipe, we're going to push it out to those devices. And uh, that recipe might look something like this. Again, you don't need to know how to configure this. This is just a, as an example. Uh, and, uh, whoop, didn't mean to advance that slide. My apologies. Let me try that again. Let me back up and let me go to my correct slide here. So chef written in Ruby, recipe, set of instructions, cookbook contains those. We've got a uh, cookbook. We're going to push that out to our chef clients. Yeah, I just wanted to give you an example of the, uh, of the code. And I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's easy to read even though we don't have to know how to create it. Here, it looks like on interface Ethernet 1 slash 1, we're setting an IP address and we have the, uh, the switch port mode disabled. So we're not an access port. We're going to be a routed port on the switch. Uh, and for the bottom interface, Ethernet 1 slash 2, there we are an access uh, switch and we're signing it to a VLAN. Very readable. Again, I'm, I'm quoting from the blueprint, recognize the characteristics of. The characteristics of Chef and Puppet, they're agent-based configuration management tools. Communicate bi-directionally with agents living on our Nexus switches. That's pretty much what you need to know. Now, well, we do have one more to go, though. And that one other one is Ansible. And this is the different one. Ansible is an agent-less option. You don't have to have agents on your devices. So even though I have Nexus switches pictured here, yeah, this would work on like your Cisco 2900 series routers. And here, the metaphor is you're going to have a playbook. A playbook is your configure, set of configuration instructions. And those configuration instructions are written in a format called YAML. And that's a weird word. And uh, I go back in the Unix days a long, long way. Uh, I started using Unix in 1989. Same time I started using Cisco routers. And I remember I used to do some C programming and there was a compiler called YAC, Y-A-C-C. And it was called yet another compiler compiler. So when I saw YAML, I thought this stands for something like yet another markup language. I think that's what it should stand for. But um, I've double checked, I've triple checked this. This is actually what it stands for from the official YAML side. It stands for YAML ain't markup language. Is anybody troubled with how that is grammatically incorrect? It, maybe, maybe it's just me, but I, I, I don't like what it stands for. But uh, YAML is the markup language, or even though it says it's not, that we're going to be using to write uh, to send our configuration instructions. And then we're going to have a list of devices to which we're going to apply those configuration instructions. And that's going to be called our inventory. And we're simply going to take our playbook, the list of instructions, and run it against our inventory. And it's going to push it out to all those devices in the inventory. Again, no agent is going to be required on our end devices. So here's what that looks like. We're going to have, uh, for example, there's a configuration where we're setting an IP address and notice that there's a parent of an interface. So I'm assigning 10.5.5.1 with the slash 26 subnet mask to gigabit ethernet one. I'm setting up an IP helper address of 10.1.1.100, but notice I've got two parents. I've got gigabit ethernet one and gigabit ethernet two. So it's gonna be applied to both of my interfaces. This is what's gonna be in my playbook. And I could then run that against 
uh, my inventory. Uh, probably wouldn't want to run that against multiple devices because we'd have duplicate IP addresses. But uh, that's what happens with Ansible. We're going to take the playbook, run it against the inventory. It goes into the Ansible server and unidirectional communication, it pushes it out to our managed devices. Wow. All right, the, uh, get ready to start typing your questions in. And by the way, when you type your questions in, uh, because there's been a lot of chatting going on, and I appreciate that, please preface your questions with question marks so I can know that those are questions for me and it's not just some of the, uh, some of the chatting that's going on behind the scenes. So please preface this with some question marks. I'll be able to easily spot them. But I did make a promise. I always like to reward people that attend the live events like you are right now. Now, I, by the way, if you're wondering about a replay, because this is such critical information, I'm gonna leave this replay, I'm gonna put a replay up later today on my, uh, on my YouTube channel and I'll leave it up for the rest of the week and then I'll take it down. Uh, but um, the reason I'll take it down is I'm going to I'm going to debut an offer right now. This is going to be my early bird special because as of right now, you're here, you're witnessing it live. I am now launching, at the risk of sounding like an Apple keynote, <laughs> the best video course that I've ever created. And, and I'm I say that a little tongue in cheek, but I'm serious. I've been creating courses for a while. This is the best one I've ever done. I cannot wait for you to get your hands on it. Here's what's going on with that course. It's called the, uh, the Cisco CCNA 200-301 Video Training Series. Here's what's in that course, and I want to give you some huge incentives for being here with me live and watching this webinar. First of all, what's in the course itself? Well, we've got 15 plus hours of video training. Again, I didn't reuse any videos from previous courses. I, I shot them all fresh. And... It covers, I was, I was meticulous about this, I promise. We cover every single topic on the exam blueprint. At the end of each lesson, you got a quiz to check your understanding. At the end of each module, you got another quiz to check your understanding. And we also give you, because there are so many glossary terms, we give you flashcards. There is a, uh, we tell you how to download this free flashcard utility for digital flashcards, and we give you the file to load into it. So it's a great way to practice terminology memorization, something we've never done before. And we've got a full-blown practice exam for you, which you can download in a PDF format with detailed explanations, or we've got, uh, not or, and we have an online exam engine where you can take it and it will grade you. So uh, a couple of ways of taking that practice exam. For hands-on, Cisco has now made Cisco Packet Tracer Labs available to everyone. You don't have to be you don't have to be enrolled in a college or a university in the Cisco Networking Academy. No, you can download it for free, and we have a uh, we did a video showing you how to download it for free. And then we've got a series of Packet Tracer Labs sprinkled throughout the course, where we give you the Packet Tracer file to load in your copy of Packet Tracer, and we give you a video saying, "All right, here's what we're going to do in this lab," and then we say, "Stop the video, do it on your own." And then come back to the video and myself and our uh, and our other instructor that helped out with this course is Charles Judd. Uh, he's going to walk you through some of them. We're going to walk you through complete step-by-step -step, uh, solutions to all those labs. And here's something you don't hear very much. They're all downloadable. A lot of times when I sell a product, people say, how long do I have access? Do I have to pay for it every year? Download it. No, you don't have to pay for it every year. Uh, and you have ongoing access. Download it. Keep it. And the price for this is $399.99. And compare that to like a $3,000 plus course that you might take from a uh, like a Cisco Learning Partner where your instructor is probably not going to be a double CCA. You're certainly not going to get recordings of the classes. You're not going to have labs to do outside of classes. It's just, it's just a whole new... Uh, I think that's an incredible value. In fact, the original price... Uh, was uh, $499.99. This was actually set by the folks over at Cisco Press Pearson uh, because the way we worked out the licensing is I'm going to be able to sell it on my site and they're going to be able to sell it on their site as well. So at the Cisco Press site, this is the course they're going to have later this year. And we, we agreed on this list price. But they gave me the flexibility to occasionally offer some discounts. And for you being here today, I'm going to offer you a discount. And I'm going to throw in some bonuses that you're going to love. So first of all, if you if you purchase this now, it's not going to be $399.99. I'm going to take 20% off. So it's only going to be 
$319.99 for all this training. It's completely comprehensive. Here's the link I want you to go to. Go to kwtrain.com slash early bird. Again, this only is valid through the end of this week. It goes away at the end of this week. But go to kwtrain.com slash early bird. And in addition to this course, I've got some bonuses for you. You ready for this? I, I, need, to, I need to take my picture off the screen because I'm going to be blocking some of the cool bonuses and I don't want to do that. We're going to give you a $97 course. You can go to my website right now and buy this course called Your IT Career Success Blueprint for $97. This is my personal development course, if you will. It tells you how to get into the IT networking industry. It tells you how to uh, create a, a resume for IT jobs, how to excel in an IT interview, how to get experience even if you don't get hired for a job, uh, how to create your own network consulting company if you want to do that, uh, how to get prepared for uh, exams. And each of the six modules has a worksheet. So this is not something you passively watch. There's a worksheet that you download and print out, and it walks you through career planning, goal setting. Uh, and we use a different goal setting model. We don't use SMART goals. We use something called dumb goals, uh, which isn't as bad as it sounds. But uh, yeah, it's, it's goal setting. It's really how to excel in your career. $97. You get that for free. Your next bonus... Your next bonus is going to be a course I recorded earlier this year because CCNA has evolved so much over the years. Uh, I got my CCNA back in 1998. And uh, back in those days, there was, we didn't have SDN and then the wireless was just on the horizon. So we really got deeper into a lot of like fundamental network stuff. And that's kind of missing these days. And, I, and, I'm, I, and I'm sad to see that. I understand it, but uh, Cisco tells us very clearly, yeah, to take the CCNA, you should probably have a couple years experience in the industry. So what I did earlier this year, I created a course called CCNA Foundations. CCNA Foundations is going to take you through the basics of networking way beyond the scope of what you need to know for this exam, just to give you a solid foundation. Uh, I did this class live and this was our best attended class ever. We had 1900 people simultaneously in class. It was wild. And uh, yeah, I sell that all the time for $197. I'm going to give it to you free with this. Your third bonus is going to be on subnetting. Uh, even though we cover subnetting in the course, this is a focused course with a downloadable, uh, downloadable exercises uh, to get really, really good at subnetting. Because for a lot of students, IP version 4 subnetting is their most challenging part of the exam. That's a $49 course that we give you for free. The only routing protocol that's on the exam blueprint is OSPF. But I want you to know it at a deeper level than just what you have to know for CCNA because... A lot of you are going to be using this in the real world. So I give you what I call my, uh, my OSPF crash course. It's a $49 course where we go deep. We go, into the, we go through the CCMP level content for OSPF. So if you're going for CCMP later on, here's your way to get your OSPF studies in. And even though it's not on the exam blueprint, I know a lot of you, are, or at least I did in the real world, I used EIGRP. When I worked at Disney World, it was all EIGRP. And I think it's uh, it's great for you to have some EIGRP knowledge, even though it's not on the blueprint. So I'm also throwing in the EIGRP crash course. That's another $49 value. And finally, for spanning tree protocol, which is on the exam, yeah, I've got a crash course on that as well. Another $499 value. You add all this up for the duration of this early bird special, $889.99. That's the value of all this. If you add it up, you get it for... About $320, $320. And I want to give you a special incentive for being here live. Now, let me pre-apologize to anybody that's watching this on replay. If you're watching this in the next few days on replay, this next part is not for you. <laughs> Just fast forward through that part uh, because I've already given you an incredible, unprecedented offer with six bonuses. I, I wanted to make it a no-brainer for you. I want you to just blow this uh, exam out of the water. I want you to crush it. So I've given you more than you need here, covering absolutely everything. You get practice questions, you get hands-on labs, you get thorough training from a double CCA, you get all these bonuses. But just as an extra special thank you for the people that are with me here live, I've got a fast acting bonus that's going to be valid just, just until the webinar is over. And by the way, don't if you're on the fence and you think, what if I don't like it? What if I hate Kevin as an instructor? Well, my thought was by doing this uh, webinar, you've heard me teach five topics. If you like that, 
then you're going to love this. But if for some reason you don't, as always, we give you a 30-day money-back guarantee. We've had very, very few people take us up on that over the years. I think we might have had literally less than 10 refunds in, uh, in nine years of doing this. So very low refund rate. I think that speaks volumes. But for you guys here and gals, I want to give you a product that you cannot buy separately. It's something I created for your bonus. And it's called Route and Switch Deep Dives. You see, once a month, I go live to, uh, to uh, I call it my inner circle. It's, uh, it's a program I have called Diver Down. And in Diver Down, we dive deep into different technical topics once a month. Uh, that's really the only way that uh, I can interact with people one-on-one -on -one and answer everybody's questions in the group. I mean, we've got like three, four, or 500 people in this call. I'm obviously not going to be able to answer everybody's questions. But in that environment, I can. And we dive deep. So I went in and I selected five topics that I thought would be good follow-ons to your CCNA studies. The only time I've ever demonstrated dynamic multipoint VPNs and all through the configuration was in a diver down. I'm going to give you that recording. IPSLA, not the basic IPSLA, but actually getting into RTR responders. Uh, I've got uh, a video or a session on uh, troubleshooting routing protocols. We've got one on multicast and rackles, vackles, and packles. That's router access control list, VLAN access control list, and port access control lists. And if you had been a member and paid to attend all these sessions, that would have been $245. For those of you that are attending live, yeah, now I don't even, I didn't even calculate it. We're well over $1,000 in value. But the caveat there is you got to buy before the webinar is over. Yes, I am trying to create urgency in you because I have seen so many people sit on the sidelines and not take, uh, and not take action. And I don't want that to be you. So please don't think this is some marketing thing that I'm trying to do. I, yes, I admit I'm trying to create urgency in you because I think it's important that you get started on this. It kills me when I see people sit on the sidelines and think that they'll do it someday. I want you to get started today. And as you're looking at this price, again, kwtrain.com slash early bird, as you're thinking about the price look, and you're on the fence, let me, let me just share with you how I make a decision like this. Uh, now, personally, um, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Tony Robbins, uh, and uh, he says uh, that when he, he takes training or when he was learning, he says by studying from somebody that's an expert, you're compressing decades into days. That's the way I look at training. And personally, I buy thousands of dollars of training for myself every year. The last product I bought was, uh, it was about $2,000, like nine, $1,997, $2,000 course. And here's the question I always ask. I ask myself, if I pay this amount of money for this course, am I going to make that money back as a result of that course? And if the answer is yes, then it's a no-brainer. You buy the course. If the answer is no, then I have to face a reality that, okay, if I don't think I'm going to make this much back from it, why am I doing it in the first place? Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe this is not for me. Maybe this is not what I need to be studying from anybody at any price. So my question to you is, if you got your CCNA next year, would that be worth $320 to you? If the answer is yes, go to that link. If the answer is no, that's okay. No, no judgment. If the answer is no, maybe you need to look at another, another track or something. If you don't think a CCNA is worth $320 for you next year, don't spend 50 hours studying it at any price if you don't think the return's going to be there. If you do think the return's going to be there, Show me something else on the market right now that does this for you. You're, you won't find it. So um, that's my spiel, and I hope you'll take advantage of it again. If you're watching this on replay, uh, this is the offer for you. If you're watching it live with me right now on the webinar, you've got to the end of the webinar to get that extra $245 bonus. Now, let me take your questions as promised. All right. Let's see here. Uh Does the subnetting simplified course include IPv6? Uh, that's a great question. IPv6 doesn't really have the concept of subnetting. So no, we, we don't subnet with IPv6. You do have a portion of the address that, that is sometimes called the subnet. But uh, yeah, we don't do subnetting with IPv6. How much... Uh, 
How much of the actual exam is practical configuration? Now that is a question mark because nobody's seen the exam yet. It comes out February the 24th of next year. But in this course, I give you tons of demonstrations. Uh, where I, I will configure and I'll show you how to verify HSRP and OSPF and VLANs and trunks and ether channel and uh, all kinds of security stuff, uh, dynamic ARP inspection, uh, DHCP snooping, port security. I'm just doing these off the top of my head. Yeah, we've got demo after demo after demo, and you get your own hands-on practice because we give you Cisco Packet Tracer Labs so you have the hands-on experience you need regardless of what they throw at you come February. Great question. Let me take a look at some of the YouTube questions. Um, how can I study for the uh, for for SDN on the ICD two test? Well, I do have. Uh, if you're going to be taking the existing exam before February the twenty fourth, yeah, I've got a CCNA. Uh, I've got my uh, CCNA route switch masterclass that covers everything you need to know for that existing exam. It's not currently on sale. I mean. You can buy it. I mean, there's not a discount right now. But go to kwtrain.com and uh, just go to our products page and it'll be there. But that'll get you ready for that. Uh, should I learn these topics after passing ICD2? Yeah, even though you pass ICD2 and you earn your current CCNA, why not? Yeah, I think this is the new stuff. I, I want, I, even if. Even if I'm not going to be doing this for certification purposes, yeah, I would want to learn the new stuff just to stay relevant in the industry. Let's see. Other questions? There's so many questions coming in here. Again, I apologize. I'm simply not able to get to everyone, so I'm just trying to scroll through here. Uh, does the SD-WAN course included? Oh, software-defined WAN. That's not on the CC. Uh, that's not on the CCNA exam. That is going to be a topic on the new. It's called the Encore exam. E N C O R. That stands for Enterprise Core. That's going to be released for the NP Enterprise Track. Um, it will be on that, but it's not on this. And yes, I am going to be making a course for that as well. That'll be coming out in a few months. But uh, right now, yeah, the focus is CCNA. Uh, let's see, uh, Mr. Wallace, I listened to your Spotify, the broadcast storm, and it's a huge advantage to listen while I'm driving and jogging. It covers so much about all Cisco certs. Oh, thank you. I really, I really appreciate that. Yeah. If you don't know, I've got a, a podcast called the broadcast storm. You can search for it on Spotify or Apple iTunes and, uh, yeah, free. Let's see, uh, somebody says, don't you have a discount on the fundamentals of network programmability course? Well, I'll tell you what, um, when you go to the checkout page, it's sort of a surprise for you. When you go to the checkout page for this, there's a checkbox that you can check if you want that course that teaches you how to program in Python and how to write programs that talk to network controllers. Uh, yeah, I've got a course for that. And I give you a uh, an option at the checkout. If you want to add that on, I give you a 50% discount on that course. It's a one-time offer during checkout. If that's for you, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the past, a huge percentage of people have taken me up on that with other offers. Uh, let's see. Uh, great insights, Kevin. Thanks for the good work. Oh, thank you very much. Why do they remove EIGRP from this course is the question. That's an awesome, uh, that's an awesome question. Personally, I love EIGRP because we used it so much at Disney World. Um, it's, I put it right there with OSPF. It's, uh, but... Um, to give it a little bit of a history lesson on that, back around 2010, because it had been Cisco proprietary, Cisco opened it up. Cisco opened it up uh, to the industry and says, all right, rest of the vendors out there, we will share EIGRP with you, but only part of it. We're not going to give you all of our EIGRP secrets. We'll share a subset of it. And basically the industry, industry said, nah, we're good. <laughs> And it was not widely adopted. Uh, now, to be fair, Juniper did adopt it on a couple of their models, but it was mainly for migrating from EIGRP. There's a couple of vendors did something with it, but it's still largely Cisco proprietary. Um, you'll get into it if you go onto the NP track. So, uh, yeah, they uh, they just gave us that one writing protocol. They even, what blew me away, I thought, okay, if they just leave OSPF in, it's going to be OSPF version 3 because it's that's IPv6 and IPv4. But no, they left, uh, they left OSP of version 2 as the routing protocol that they teach in this course, which is strictly IP version 4. They're, so again, I think this compared to the previous exam, it seems easier. I haven't seen the exam. Nobody's seen the exam yet. But from all indications, 
it's easier, which I'm all about that. Uh, and, I, and I really do think it's appropriate for your introductory level, uh, introductory level course. Let's see here. Um, looking for so if you pass the ccna before february you'll get training cert badge also yeah if you pass your ccna uh the current ccna before february before february the 14th or excuse me 24th <laughs> february the 24th i was thinking valentine's day for some reason if you pass it before february the 24th yes come february the 24th you automatically get the quote unquote new cca so it's not like you're going to have an employer that says now, we really wanted somebody with the new CC, uh, excuse me, CCNA, uh, because you'll have the new CCNA come in. So, uh, yeah, if you want to take it, if you want to take the current one before then, and you've already started your study, great, keep going. Uh, yeah, go to kwtraining.com, check out my uh, masterclass uh, on uh, the CCNA route switch. That'll give you everything you need to know to pass. But I know a lot of people are just kind of getting into this, and they want to, uh, they don't want that time pressure, and they want to be ready come the end of February to take this exam. This is for you. All right, let's take a couple more questions. Uh, wow, so many questions. Thank you. Just a heartfelt thank you to everybody for taking some time out of your day. I don't take it lightly that you give me an hour and a half of your day. Um, I hope I've been a good steward of your time and you've learned some stuff. Let's see. Do network engineers actually need to be programmers in the future? That is an awesome question. Let's talk about that. Do they need to be programmers in the future? The, uh, the What I'm hearing from Cisco seems to be a little bit uh, divided on that. I remember about three years ago at Cisco Live, um, I, I remember I got the front row seat, which is really cool. I think that's when Tim Cook was the, uh, Tim Cook was one of the guest speakers that, uh, that, uh, that came up on stage. But I remember that they were saying during the, the main keynote, they said that the uh, uh, Chuck Robbins specifically said this, uh, the head of Cisco. He said that the engineer of the future, he called the hybrid engineer. He showed a, like a Venn diagram where you've got programming skills and you've got traditional networking skills and that area of overlap where you've got both. He called that the engineer of the future. And he called them the hybrid engineer where you knew about both. And Cisco has actually recently this year released programming tracks uh, and they want people to be programmers. But for the first time this year, I heard it phrased differently. Chuck Robbins this time talked about uh, the ideal networking team. Instead of being an engineer that knew both, he talked about having a team. That was his word. Where you would have a team that would be the like the operations uh, or, or, the, or the development and another team that was the operation. That's DevOps that we talked about. So now it seems like Cisco is saying, yeah, DevOps is the way of the future where you've got a team, where you've got people that go deep into programming. You've got people that go deep into networking. But I think that everybody should know a little bit about the other world to be conversant between the, the, the development and the operations people. I think everybody under the sound of my voice right now should learn some Python programming if you don't already know it. And if you are a programmer, I think you should learn some CLI configuration. I think we need to be conversant with one another about what's going on. All right, one more question. Let me find a good one here. Wow, so many questions. Uh, Somebody says, can I share a special pricing for the CCNA security exam? We always have a Black Friday uh, and Cyber Monday special at the end of November. I'm sure there'll be a discount uh, on the security stuff at that time. Let's see, trying to find a good one. Yeah, if I want to build a home lab with real equipment, what is the minimum um, older equipment, routers and switches and Wi-Fi I should get? Well, let me show you the uh, the Wi-Fi the wireless access point I'm using right now is uh, it's not new by any means. And I've been logged out. Let me log back in. I'm running a, uh, a 4402 wireless network controller. I bought that from eBay for about 50 bucks. Uh, for routers, personally, you could probably get by with something less expensive. Personally, I would probably buy about three of the 2911 uh, routers, and I would buy three Cisco Catalyst switches. 
I would buy a 3560 to give me my layer three switch and I would buy two 2960s. That would let me do spanning tree, ether channel, trunks, VLANs. That's what I would do. I'd buy three routers and three switches. You could get by with less. That's what I would do. And also the wireless line controller. All right, we're about to wrap it up now. So again, I don't want to belabor any more of this. Uh, I'll put a replay up of this on my YouTube channel later today. But uh, let me do this. I, I said that this offer goes away at the end of the webinar. So I'm going to start a timer right now. I'm going to give you a 10 minute timer because I know some people that are watching this live, they might've paused it, <laughs> taken a bio break and came back. Uh, so I want to give you a 10 minute grace period here. I'm going to give you a 10 minute countdown. When this countdown reaches zero, I'm manually taking out that, uh, that $245 bonus, the, uh, the, uh, the route switch deep dives that was just for people attending live while still leaving this unprecedented offer for anybody else that wants to pick it up uh, for the remainder of the week. Thank you so much for giving me a slice of your day, everyone. Uh, for those of you that have jumped on board and uh, taken this, uh, taken this uh, enrolled in this course, I cannot wait to hear feedback. One of the things that really lights me up is getting those emails and social media posts saying, Kevin, I, I passed my CCNA today, or I passed my CCMP today, or I got a promotion today. The fact that I get to touch people's lives like that, it, I, I mean, literally right now, I've got chill bumps just thinking about how blessed I am to be able to do this work and help other people. This is the best course I've ever done. If you want to get your CCNA, I think this is the best way to do it. Thanks, everyone. See you soon.